front of the dead little girl. The Japanese sword lies on the floor close by, a treasure, a talisman, a spoil of war that the governor hasn't let out of his sight since the debacle at the racetrack. Its implications now the furthest thing from his mind. All right, it's not completely fresh, he says, indicating the gray appendage. But I swear this thing was walking not two hours ago. The tiny cadaver jerks against its chain 18 inches from its hand. It emits another little growl a broken, chatty Cathy doll, and turns its frosted glass eyes away from the tidbit. Come on, Penny, it's not that bad. He inches closer and waves the dripping, severed foot in front of her. It's pretty large, hard to tell if it's male or female. The toes are small, but all natural, no remnants of polish. And it has already begun to turn blue-green and stiffen with rigor mortis. And it's only gonna get worse. You don't, you don't need it now, so... Come on, sweetie. Do it for an enormous thud. Makes the governor jerk with a start on the floor. What the hell? He turns toward the front door across the room. Another massive thud rings out. The governor rises to his feet. A third impact on the door results in drywall dust sifting down from the lintel and a faint cracking noise along the seams of the deadbolt. What the hell do you want, he calls out, and don't beat on my damn door so hard. The fourth impact snaps the deadbolt and chain, the door swinging open so hard it bangs into the adjacent wall in a burst of wood shards and dust the knob embedding itself into the wood like a dowel. The inertia drives the intruder into the room on a whirlwind. The governor tenses in the center of the living room, fists falling up, teeth clamping down in a tableau of fight or flight instinct. He looks as though he's seeing a ghost materialize next to his second-hand sofa. Michonne tumbles into the apartment, nearly falling on her face from all the forward momentum. She skids to a halt three feet away from the subject of her quest. Getting her balance back, she squares the shoulders and fists also clenched, feet planting firmly now, head tilted forward in an offensive posture. And for the briefest of moments, they stand facing each other. Michonne has put herself together on the way over, her jumpsuit straightened, her top tucked in, headband tightened around her lush braids, to the point where she looks as if she's ready to begin a work day or possibly go to a funeral. After an unbearable pause, the two combatants staring each other down in an almost pathologically intense manner emit the first sound, and it comes from the governor. Well, well. His voice is low, flat, cold, with zero affect or emotion. This should be interesting. <laughs> now, a fight, the spontaneous hand-to-hand -hand kind, comes in many varieties. In the East, the business of fighting is zen-like studied. In Asia, the weaker opponent learns to use the adversary's strength against them. The melee is settled promptly. On the other end of the spectrum, the competitive rings around the world, freestyle battles can last for hours. But a third kind of fist fight occurs in the dark back alleys of American cities during which opponents engage in a wholly different kind of battle fast and brutal and unpredictable, sometimes awkward. The common street fight is usually over within seconds. Street fighters have a tendency to shotgun their blows at each other willy-nilly, driven by rage, and the whole fracas usually ends in a draw, or worse, with somebody finally pulling a knife or a firearm to bring things to a quick, mortal conclusion. 
The battle that ensues in the governor's living room that night encompasses all three styles and spans a grand total of 87 seconds. The first five of which involve very little fighting. It begins with the two opponents planted where they stand staring into each other's eyes. Quite a bit of nonverbal information is exchanged during those first five seconds. Michonne keeps her gaze welded to the governor's and the governor stares back at her, neither adversary giving the other so much as a blink. And the room seems to crystallize like a diorama seized up in ice. Then right around second number three, the governor averts his gaze for a scintilla of a moment to the floor on his right flank. He makes note of both the child and the sword, each of which lie beneath within his grasp. Penny seems oblivious to the human drama unfolding, her livid pasty face buried in the bucket of entrails now. The sword gleams in the dull light of an incandescent bulb. The governor tries his hardest over the course of that split instant not to register any panic or any outwardly visual concern for his little dead girl's safety. The idea forming in his mind, very quickly the human brain can formulate complex notions in the smallest soup con of time that he just might be able to grab that sword and conclude matters quickly. In the space of that single instant, the third in a series of 87, Michonne also flicks her own gaze toward that katana saber. Second number four finds the governor snapping his gaze back up at Michonne. In that time, she also glances back at the governor. The governor knows now she knows what he's thinking, and she knows he knows. And the next half second, the, ne the next number five second recalls the end of a countdown. The engines fire and the thing explodes. It takes six seconds for the next phase of the encounter to unfold. The governor dives for the sword. Michon lets out a booming cry. No! And by the time the governor's shoulder hits the carpet three feet from the blade and his outstretched hand has approached the general vicinity of that magnificent handle with its scaly serpentine pattern, Michon has also moved in with the suddenness of a thunderclap. She instinctively delivers the first blow of the conflict at second number 11. Her leg comes up and she kicks out at him. The hard edge of a boot strikes the side of his face below the temple just as he is grasping the sword's handle. The sickly crack of hard leather fracturing a human mandible fills the room. A sound not unlike a celery stalk snapping. And the governor winces backward in agony, a thread of blood flinging from his mouth. He falls onto his back. The sword unmoves. The next eight seconds are a mishmash of explosive movement and sudden stillness. Michonne takes advantage of the governor's punch-struck stupor. He has managed to roll over on his elbows and knees now, his face leaking blood all over the place, his lungs heaving by darting quickly toward the fallen sword. She snatches it up and whirls back around in less than three seconds and then spends the next four seconds marshalling her breath and preparing to deliver the killing blow. By this point, exactly 19 seconds have elapsed, and it looks as though Michonne has the advantage. Penny has glanced up from her feeding trough and softly growls and sputters at the two adversaries. The governor manages to rise on his wobbly knees, his face, without him even being aware of it, takes on an expression of pure, unadulterated bloodlust. His mind a TV screen at the end of a programming day, a blank wall of humming white noise, blocking out all extraneous thought other than killing this bitch right this instant. He instinctively lowers his center of gravity as a cobra might coil itself 
before striking. You can see the sword in her hand like a divining rod absorbing all the energy in the room. He drips blood and drool from his mouth. Michonne stands only five feet away from him now with the sword raised. 27 seconds have transpired. One well-placed strike with that beveled razor's edge and it will all be over. At 30 seconds, the governor lunges. The next maneuver on her part covers a total of three seconds. One, she lets him get within inches of her and two, she unleashes one of her patented groin kicks. And three, the blow immobilizes him. At this proximity, the steel reinforced toe of her work boot connects with such extreme results that the go governor literally folds in half, all his breath forced out of him. <laughs> the mixture of blood, snot, and saliva in his mouth spewing out in a spray across the floor. He lets out a garbled grunt and falls to his knees before her gasping the breath. <laughs> The pain like a battering ram smashing through his guts. He flails his arms for a moment as though trying to hold on to something and then falls to his hands and knees. Bloody vomit roars out of him, splashing the carpet at her feet. At 40 seconds, things suddenly settle down. The governor watches and wretches and coughs at the same time, trying to get himself to, together on the floor. He can feel her standing over him, gazing down at him with that eerie calm. He can sense her raising that blade. He swallows the bitter taste of bile in his throat and closes his eyes and waits for the whisper of hand-forged steel to kiss the back of his neck and end it all. This is it. He waits to die on the floor like a whipped dog. He opens his eyes. She hesitates. He hears her voice, as smooth and tranquil and cold as a cat purring. I didn't want it to end this quick. Fifty seconds have transpired. I don't want it to be over. She says, standing over him, the blade wavering. 55 seconds. Deep in the recesses of the governor's brain, a spark, a spark kindles. He has one chance, one last shot at him. He feigns another cough. <laughs> he doesn't look up. He coughs again, but ever so subtly, ever so subtly, he blinks and peers at her feet. Those steel-toed boots spread shoulder width in front of him, only inches away from his hands. One last chance. At the 60th second, he pounces at a lower region. Taken by surprise, the woman tumbles backward. The governor lands on top of her like a lover, the sword flinging across the floor. The impact knocks the wind out of her. He can smell her musky scent. As she wreathes beneath him, the sword only about 18 inches away on that carpet, the gleam of the blade catches his eye. At second number 65, he makes a play for the sword, reaching for the hilt. But before it has a chance to get a hold of it, her teeth sink into the meat of his shoulder where it meets his neck, and she bites him so hard her teeth penetrate flesh and layers of subcutaneous tissue, and finally down into the muscle. The searing pain is so sudden and enormous and sharp that he shrinks like a little girl. He rolls away from her, moving on instinct now, clutching at his neck, feeling the wetness seeping through his fingers, Michonne rearing back and spitting a mouthful of tissue, the blood running down the front of her in thick rivulets. Fuck! Fuck! Jay! Bitch! He managed to sit up. He manages to sit and stench the flow of blood with his hand. It doesn't occur to him that she might have very well breached his jugular and he's already a dead man. It doesn't occur to him that she's going to go for the sword. It doesn't even occur to him that she's rising up over her hand. All he can think about right then, at 73 seconds into the fight, 
is stopping all that blood from leaking out of his neck. 75 seconds. He swallows the metallic taste in his mouth and tries to, tries to see through watery eyes as his blood soaks the ancient carpet. At 76 seconds, he hears inhaling sounds as his opponent takes a deep breath and rises up over him and then mutters something that sounds a little like, I got a better idea. The first blow of the sword's blunt-ended handle strikes his skull above the bridge of his nose. It makes a loud clapping noise in his ears, the brunt of a Louisville slugger hitting the sweet spot of a hardball and pins him to the floor. Ears ringing, vision blurring, pain strangling him. He makes one last attempt to grab her ankles with the iron heart and handle comes down again on him. 83 seconds into the confrontation, he collapses. A dark shade coming down over his vision. The final blow to his skull comes 86 seconds in, but he barely feels it. One second later, everything goes completely black, and he's floating in space. Thank you.